Good morning, everyone, or if you're joining us from Europe, good afternoon. I'm Deborah Rodriguez. Uh, I'm the marketing manager at ZV, and I just want to say thank you for taking time today to join us for our webinar. We really appreciate the fact that you're taking time out of your busy schedule to join us, and so we'll, we'll make every effort to keep this brief, but also very informative. The first thing I just wanted to let you know before I turn things over to our speaker is that we will be recording today's presentation and then we'll post it on our website, dv.com, so that if you want to share it with your colleagues or you want to go back and review it, um, you'll have access to it. We're also going to be sending out the PowerPoint presentation to you after the, uh, the webinar. We'll send you an email that has that in it so you can use it for, um, for future reference. Um, if you have any questions after the webinar closes, you are welcome to email me at marketing at cv.com and I will make sure to forward your uh, question to Arthur or whoever is the appropriate person to answer you. And finally, during the presentation, if you have any questions, um, we, we, want, we want to encourage you to go ahead and ask those questions, but with an audience as large as we have today, um, we can't just open the floor. So what, what we would like you to do is uh, look at the, the question panel on your screen there. You can type your question into there, and then I will um, forward along your questions to Arthur throughout the presentation so that uh, we can try to get those questions answered in a timely way. We'll also have a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so you're welcome to, um, to ask your questions, hold off and ask your question at the very end if you prefer. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Arthur, who is our presentation today, presenter today. Arthur Rowe has worked um, in, in cable television and RF for 40 years. He's a real veteran. He's a pro. He knows, he knows everything. If, if Arthur doesn't know it, then nobody knows it. That's, that's where I'm coming from. He works with Teldis um, in London, and um, he's been there for 24 years. He's also a fellow with SCTE. So uh, again, he's a real veteran and pro. And with that, Arthur, I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay. Thank you, Debs. Thank you very much. Thank you, one and all, online, everyone listening in. Um, yeah, good. Uh, good to be doing this now. So uh, I'll kick off the uh, I'll kick off the presentation now, and uh, let's see where we go. So uh, first thing to say, of course, is some folks love New York, but me, I love coax. Now, during the presentation, it could be that I get so enthusiastic that Deb will have to come on in and start tempering this enthusiasm. So let's see where this goes. So uh, basically, this presentation is for those who are not familiar with coax. Maybe it's not your, your first choice, your, the industry you're working in at this time, but also those folks who are. Uh, I, I uh, I vouch will learn one or two interesting things, and that's what this presentation is about. Really, it's an overview. Um, in doing so, it uh, it brings up some rather surprising and interesting facts about coax, uh, and we will be dipping down through a timeline. We'll be going back in time to try and uh, try and identify those areas of interest. So, uh, beginning with the the question right at the top, uh, what is coaxial cable anyway? Well, uh, if you ask that question of a lot of folks, they'll say, yes, I know coax, that's, that's an aerial cable, uh, it's brown, uh, I've had an aerial for years, that's what it is, it's an aerial cable. You ask other folks, and they will say, no, no, it's a black cable, uh, it's a satellite cable, I've had it since, uh, since I've had my dish, it's the satellite delivery method for TV. You ask other people, uh, and especially uh, younger, younger people and people in uh, other industries that possibly deliver TV, and they will say, no, no, coax, that's an old technology. They will say, if there's one thing that illustrates old television, it's coax. You know, we lump it in with analog, uh, analog transmission and tube TV, so they're, they're firm on that. They say, no, this is old technology. Hey, is it, is it still here? 
you ask other people and they say, other people maybe with a little, a little eye on the future, and they say, well, no, actually, it's not new technology, it's current technology. And they'll point out that it's got a fantastic bandwidth. They'll also say it's got a better bandwidth than the so-called newer technology copper alternatives. And hey, it's always been here. It's current technology. So we'll look at a piece of coax cable, dismantle it, go through a few basic recognizable elements. Um, first thing you'll notice is the center core there, the copper center core. Usually solid, preferably solid, and for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to assume that that's one millimeter in diameter. Helps a lot with what we're talking about later. So holding the center core in place is the dielectric material. Now this material separates the center core from the screen that surrounds it. And it can be made of many different materials and its construction is different as well. This is a very important element of the coaxial cable and we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit later on. The best material by far for this dielectric would be free air, fresh air, but there are reasons why we can't do that as I'm sure you'll realize. Um, so the dielectric material something of a compromise, but a best compromise. Of course, the cable finishes normally with a foil shield, and over the top of that we've got a braid. So this, of course, is the second element, the second conductor to what is a two-conductor cable. So there we are. Everybody knows what it is. Some people know it well. Some people have worked with it long. Uh, some people are new to it. Very few people know about its origin. Why is that important? The purpose of this presentation is to promote its benefits going forward. A uh, few people do that now. They look, at, uh, they look at other technologies and other methods, but it's important that we push this forward, um, partly because it's so, so relevant in a way a lot of folks will tell you it isn't. So let's go back to some sort of basic elements. Let's go uh, back to nature and we'll look at the, the frequency of nature. Let's see where coax figures in this uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So right at the bottom here we've got sound waves up into uh, AM radio waves. And then this whole section here under radio waves is everything basically that we are carrying in a coax cable. You'll notice frequency at the top there in megahertz, and you'll notice the distance of the wavelength in meters. One interesting element, something to stick on this, is the one meter area here, the one meter wavelength is corresponding very approximately to 300 megahertz as a frequency. Fix that in your mind, we'll come back to that later. So what does nature do with the Frequency spectrum, well, it goes up from radio waves, which is what we handle on a piece of coax. It goes up through microwaves. It goes into the infrared spectrum, where the energy is making heat, through visible light, where we come to harmful radiations, UV, etc. Uh, harmful when the power is high, of course. So we know uh, we know exactly what creates that sort of energy. And then up through X-rays into, uh, into gamma rays and beyond, uh, and we don't, want to be, uh, we don't want to be involving ourselves there. So what we're going to do now is jump back a little. We're going to jump back a little bit in time, excuse me. We're going to jump back in time um, because we want to try and understand and define something about the history of coax. By far the best coaxial connector we can choose is the F connector. And you'll see here on our, on our timeline that back in the early 50s in the US, uh, Mr. Winston here invented the F connector. Now he, he needed a good quality, correctly matching connector for the purposes of the uh, cable TV industry that was taking off in the States at that time. 
So it was important he did that, and it's interesting, I think, to, to, uh, to see that what we look at now as a satellite connector has been around a good 60 odd years before there were any satellites. So good connector, we say good job USA on that one. Okay, now we're going back to the previous slide, but we're zooming in, we're, we're coming in on the RF frequency spectrum, or the spectrum of frequencies that we are handling in our coaxial cable. We start at the same point, DC, no hertz. We go up through AM radio, through TV return paths on cable TV systems, up through FM radio, into the VHF band with digital audio broadcasting. The whole DOCSIS area there at the top is for the cable TV boys to be handling interactive elements, internet, that sort of thing, over coax. As we carry on up through the VHF cable TV bands, past our 300 megahertz point there, we come into the interesting area for us when it comes to ZV modulator products, because we choose to use these frequencies for our distribution. So, above that, of course, we have through the air mobile comms, and above that, into the higher levels of signals that coax or frequencies that coax can handle, we're into the satellite bands that come down from the LMBs fixed to our dishes. And that's, uh, it's interesting we talk about dishes because uh, dishes, of course, are very new, very new delivery method for TV. Dishes are comparatively new in the history of transmission. Well, what are they? If we take the timeline back a little further, you'll see that small dish antennas were first used in the early 1940s, and they were used, uh, they were used as shown in the nose cone of this. US aircraft for um, fighter interception, detecting detecting aircraft at night, that sort of thing. And it was only possible to use these after the invention of centimetric radar, very high frequency UHF microwaves near enough radar. So uh, what's interesting here, of course, is the dish antenna was in use 20, 30 years before it was subsequently used as a means for satellite reception. So why is that particularly interesting? Well, the point to make here, of course, is you now don't need me to tell you the sort of cable that was used to connect these dish antennas to the amplifiers, to the receiver uh, transmitters. It was coax, of course. So. We're going to look at the cable uh, in its simplest specified form. So this sort of specification, this sort of chart is the sort of chart that a cable manufacturer will furnish you with when you buy his cable. And what it and it's the it's the commonly used method for specking and understanding the performance of cable. And what we've got here, we're back to our one millimeter inner core. We measure cable loss over a 100 meter distance, and what we do is we plot its loss at a certain frequency, and that loss is measured in dBs along the, along the Y line there. So coming back to our dVBT area of activity, which is where our Z modulators are launching their signals into our networks, we're working on these these frequencies very roughly. So we could expect a loss through our 1 mil coax cable of around about 20 dBs if we choose high frequencies. And if we choose lower frequencies there, we could be 15 dBs or lower. And that's quite important. Uh, we'll see that when we apply it to a typical layout of a coax distribution system. We'll see how that manifests itself. A uh, simple point here, 6 dBs in this method has a half or doubling effect. If you look very closely, as, as we double the frequency, uh, we are approximately adding 6 dBs of loss to the overall loss. 
the 60B rule applies from the middle of the curve up and down, ceases to apply as you get nearer to the end. But it's an interesting thing to note. Okay, the next three slides we'll go through quickly. Don't be frightened by them. They're just showing screenshots from a spectrum analyzer. And in this case, we're looking at the ZV2840 modulator. We're taking the four channels out, these four multiplexes here, as adjacent channels, beginning with the marker here in UHF channel 21 at 474 megahertz. And the purpose of this screenshot is to show you a measured signal strength. We talked about the dBs being a ratio. We'll work on dBs for everything here in our planning whether it be level, loss, or gain. So the output of this device is measured here, 100 dB microvolts. We use dB microvolts in Europe. In the States, you tend to use dB millivolts, in which case, take 60 off that figure. For the purposes of this talk, we'll stick with dB microvolts. So here's a measurement of the launch level of our ZV modulator. So we'll quickly click into the next screen, which shows us a constellation diagram. Now, we'll not dwell on this. This is showing us a measurement of the errors before and after correction, errors within the packets, errors within the modulation. These little spots exist within the cells. If we design the perfect modulator, they'd all be spotting on top of each other, we have very little scatter. So the element of scatter is a visual indication of the element of errors. If they scatter outside these, these uh, predefined areas, we have a problem. Being a ZV product, we have no problem. On to the third slide, which in many ways is the most important, I think, and contains a valid point that we should be aware of. Okay. Bar, bar chart indications there of the errors will not involve ourselves in that. The modulation errors, giving us a figure of 30 odd dBs. ZV will argue it's more, and it will be more measured on bench equipment. This analyzer is a typical in the field analyzer. It's what you'll find in the real world. It's what the, the sort of measurements that you're going to get in the real world. What's really important and interesting here is the noise margin. The noise margin here is defined as 9 dBs. And what that means effectively is we are 9 dB safe on loss of service. Now, 9, 9 dB, small number, is actually a very big number and it represents a huge amount of safety. Think about it. What we're doing with the ZV modulator, we're creating a DVB-T signal, a terrestrial digital signal. And of course, terrestrial digital signals have been modulated and designed to be thrown off the top of transmit towers across huge distances, subjected to the geography, the weather, the atmospherics, bouncing around in and out of buildings in the city, all sorts of electrical impulse noise. So this margin assumes that we're going to do exactly that with the signals we've created. We're going to subject them to a lot of issues. So we're 9 dB safe, we're 9 dB survivable. That is a huge amount of margin. We will have to try very, very hard to destroy that margin and destroy our signal. Think about it, our signal, we're distributing through cables. It was designed to be transmitted, trashed, received on antennas, then distributed through cables. Okay, next we're going to look at a simple diagram showing some level and loss on a simple coaxial network. And for this, we'll use the HD2840 that we were looking at earlier on the analyzer. We're defining its maximum output as 100 dB microvolts. Next 
We will go straight onto the PV receipt of the tuna because we now need to define the minimum input. And I'm suggesting a figure here of 60 dB microvolts as a minimum safe, reliable input to retain our service. Now, theoretically, we can run it very much lower. And on the bench and in controlled environments, we can run it uh, quite a bit lower successfully. However, we live in the real world of potential interference, of compromised screening, and of other things that might come together to start eroding our degree of safety. So we're going to stay above that level. We're not running anything too close here. Uh, this simple network is comprised of cable, with cable loss defined. You remember the cable loss chart against distance. We have simple splitters and multi-taps, all with loss values attached. And with a home run cable to the TV, we very easily and quite simply from one ZV device can serve tens of televisions over an area of 100 or so square meters. So this simple network could represent something like a sports bar. But we can do so much more than this. Because if you think about it, the 40 dBs of link budget that we have embedded here is very easily extended by the use of simple amplifiers. We can increase the link budget. We can have more splitters, more taps, a lot more cable. With just two or three of these sorts of amplifiers, we can serve hundreds of screens in larger areas. And with sophisticated amplifier networks, we can serve thousands of screens. So there's no practical limit to the amount of easy distribution possible on coax. And as we saw earlier, we're actually very robust and immune because of our noise margin. Okay, back to the cable. A question. Uh, question I'm often asked is, why is the characteristic impedance 75 ohms? You pick up a piece of coax anywhere, wherever use it's being put to, it'll say 75 ohms. How, how, who decided that? Okay, still answer, uh, and it relates to the use of a simple antenna. One thing you'll see as we go through here is that coax is a synergy with antennas. Coax could be an antenna. An antenna could be a piece of coax. You'll see that. Here's an example. To make a very simple antenna, we would simply take the inner core of the coax, connect it to an aluminium rod of a predetermined length. The same thing with the screen on the other side. We make a simple antenna. And in this case, at these dimensions, we've built ourselves a half-wave dipole antenna at 600 megs. So the reason that 75 ohms was chosen as a, a characteristic impedance for our distribution networks is because a simple dipole antenna compelled it to be the case because a simple dipole antenna at that position offers 75 ohms itself as a characteristic impedance. So we're matching the coax cable to the antenna specification simply that's why 75 ohms. Looking at antennas a little more, but very briefly, the simple dipole that we've just seen was, uh, was incorporated within a more sophisticated antenna back in the middle 1920s when our two Japanese friends, Mr. Yagi and Mr. Ude, invented the Yagi antenna or created the Yagi antenna. And that's simply uh, a method with directive, reflective elements, whereby you can increase the gain of an antenna. Interesting footnote here. Um, Mr. Uday was actually the engineer. Mr. Yagi was the guy who wrote up the report. Lesson for us all there, I think. Okay. Uh, let's go back in time a little further, because we're traveling back in time with coax. This is a familiar beast, the simple coax plug and socket. Now, this was a British invention, as you can see, invented in the UK in the early 20s, 
has a standard connector for simple AM radio recipients. In truth, the coaxial plug as we see it, as we use it today, is not very good in as much as it doesn't impedance match very well. Perfectly okay for simple antennas. For higher frequencies, it's beaten by the F connector we saw earlier. So for that reason, uh, folks, it's best not to use these sort of connectors in your coaxial distribution network. One thing that never ceases to put a smile on my face, how many millions, billions of television sets have been manufactured over the years? They're being manufactured right now as we speak, and they're using as their primary input source a coaxial plug, coaxial socket, a 93-year-old connector is being used on modern television. I love that. Okay, we're now going to look at coax as being something slightly more sophisticated than just a piece of copper wire. The reason it's so good is because it's what we call a transmission line. It's transmission line technology. Now, this, this simple piece of flat ribbon here, a lot of you folks would probably recognize because these things used to be packed in with our stereo tuners and receivers back in the days of hi-fi. This little ribbon would be our FM antenna and the cable that takes the antenna to the ports on the back of the box. It's a transmission line. Coaxial cable is a transmission line. And interestingly here on printed circuit boards where we run two printed lines together, we've created another transmission line. So what is a transmission line? Well, simply a transmission line is an efficient way efficient low loss way of carrying very high frequencies long distances through cables. To elaborate a little further, a transmission line is necessary where the wavelength of the frequencies you are carrying occur a multiple of times along the distance or the length of that cable. Remember back to the, uh, the chart earlier when I said 300 megahertz is one meter as a wavelength. Okay, we're operating below that. We're a fraction of a meter and we're attempting to take these signals through hundreds of meters of cable. Hence the need for a transmission line. So applying it to coaxial cable if we were to show a piece of cut a piece of cable, stick it on the bench in front of us, if we were to represent that as a series of components, it would look something like this. Here's the inner core, the screen. The, the signal is subjected to an inductive effect. So we've got an inductor here. And the inductive effect was illustrated earlier in the cable loss chart, you'll remember when we saw how we were resisting high frequencies, subjecting them to more loss than we were low frequencies. That's an inductive effect. In addition to that, we have a resistance, the overall resistance of the material. Copper has a low resistance, but a resistance nonetheless. So we can see how the frequencies are behaving through the cable and how it's defined. Another interesting effect here, and I talked about the dielectric of the cable being very important, and it's very important for this reason. The high frequencies that we're attempting to run through the inner core will be attracted through the dielectric to the screen. And that can be a bad thing. We have to be careful about that. We have to be mindful that our dielectric has that property. There's a capacitive property there. Low frequencies, not bother. They'll fly along the inner core happily. High frequencies, we have to guard against the possibility of them skinning off the end of our core. And that leads us on to skid effect. So we've got a representation here of the inner core of the cable. It's still our one millimeter inner core. And I, I pose the, the question there, skid effect, or, if you like, when, a cable, when, it, when is a cable really an antenna? Because what you'll see on the blue column there is the effects 
of the, the current density. It's decreasing as the frequency increases. So what's happening is our signals are starting to, rather than fly down the bore of the, the core, they're actually starting to spread outwards and live on the outer skin of the, of the inner core. And that's absolutely fine. Um, and re there are many reasons why, why it does this. Uh, there are very complex magnetic fields and eddy currents that exist around a cable that bears this signal. So skin effect is interesting. Um, of course, what that means on the cable itself is that we're likely to start losing some of these high frequencies if we're not careful. So uh, that's something that we need to be careful about for legacy cables, where we're inheriting a, a coax network and attempting to put our signals along it. We've got to ask ourselves, was that cable network always designed for lower frequencies? Um, and do we have an inner core diameter of less than one millimeter? Because that's a worry. It's not impossible to use it. It's, uh, we need to be slightly more concerned and need to look at the figures more. So generally, skin effect is bad unless you can harness it in a positive way. And in order to do that, we need to apply some lateral thinking and some mechanical engineering. And the next slide will show you what we can do if we're very clever. So here's a different type of cable. This is called heliax or helical cable. Um, and as you can see, it differs quite considerably in many respects. And this is this is the granddaddy of coax cable. This, this is the top of the heap. So let's look at the elements that we now understand about coax cable. Here's the inner core. The inner core, of course, has now become a hollow tube. It's become a hollow tube because there seems little point in carrying the heavy, constricted, expensive core because we can now efficiently carry the frequencies we choose. Uh, across the outer skin of the copper. And because it's three-dimensional, we've got a huge outer skin of copper, so we can very efficiently carry this signal at very low losses. second point about the helical cable is the dielectric element. You remember at the start we said, wouldn't it be great if we could have some free air as the separation medium there for the dielectric? That would, uh, that would be very desirable. Um, and we've, we've very nearly achieved that with helical cable. We use uh, a, a novel spiral method of dielectric material. So we're predominantly free air, which is a good thing. The other thing is if you look at the amount of, of copper, the amount of metal work we've got here, you could see, this is a large version, you could see we can bear huge amounts of power. And that's a, that's a bit of a clue to where this sort of cable is most commonly used. Um, and it won't surprise you to know that this is a transmission cable, not a distribution cable. One final point on the cable, those with a keen eye will have spotted that the relative proportion of the thickness of the inner core to the overall outer diameter is larger. We've got a larger core than we had on our distribution cable. And the reason for that is this isn't a 75 ohm cable. This is decreed a 50 ohm cable because the power transfer calculations that we do to uh, plan transmission lines like this tell us that it happens more efficiently at 50 ohms. Now, without this cable, uh, there would be no terrestrial transmitters, there would be no cell phone transmitters, there would be no way to send signals to satellites, so no satellite television. And, and I, I pull a, a phrase I've used before at this point, if coaxial cables cease to exist overnight, it would be necessary to reinvent it the following day. There is no other way to do these things, no coax means no TV. So let's keep walking back into the past, shall we? Because we still haven't found out how old coax is or where it came from. Uh, so let's let's go let's go there and find it. So coax predates the dawn of flight, 1903. 
Now that predates Marconi's first transatlantic transmissions. There was no modulation techniques involved there. What Marconi had done actually was invent the world's largest spark plug to all intents and purposes. But the next bullet point slide tells you that we predate the motor car and we've now dropped back another century. I love that. So I know what you're thinking, where is all this going to end? Presumably we'll end up in ancient Egypt at some point soon. But no, now is the point now is the time that I want to introduce you to someone. Someone very important to Calax. Mr. Rather Heavy Side. Now way back in 1880, our mathematician and electrical engineer invented coax cable. He patented the design. Well, that's only half the story. Um, Oliver, brilliant Victorian maverick engineer, he was a telegraph engineer. Last week's off talk, he conceived coaxial cable as a transmission line cable for carrying telegraph signals, 1880. In truth, the design was way ahead of its time. It was 20, 30 years or more before its use began to be uh, in, in, you know, considered for what was then telephone lines and the expanding bandwidth necessary for telephone lines. Uh, a final sort of uh, postscript to, to Oliver is, uh, bless him, the, the Bell Telephone Company back in the States in the early 1900s approached him, came over to see him. They said, Oliver, we've got a great idea. You're going to love this. It's going to be a boring success, lucrative market. The, the pair of us and you, the three of us, we're going to be rich. And Oliver, bless him, being English, being quite mad, and without any international patent, he saw no financial benefit from his invention. So, as we near the end, we'll come back to the question we posed right at the beginning. We asked, what is coax cable today? Well, one possible answer could be coaxial cable is a leading edge, 134-year-old technology. How cool is that? We'll conclude. Okay, so coax has an overwhelming legacy. It exists practically everywhere and it's quite suitable with care for retrospective installs. We can reuse old coax in the care. Coax has the lowest material cost per point. It's cheaper than all competing options. Coax is a bandwidth that far exceeds structured wiring all through the air technologies. They are all catching up on coax even now. I should say, when I mention all competition, that optical fiber outdoes coax for bandwidth, but optical fiber is not up for consideration here because it's the highest cost option. Another phrase I frequently pull out, all the technologies that threaten to make coax obsolete are being adapted to run on it. Look at the mocker initiatives. Lots of people spend a lot of time looking to see exactly what sort of signals, exactly what sort of services they can get through coax because it already exists. Final point here, I make the uh, I make the suggestion that we 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 make a coax cell now, make it today, while all the plucky contenders slug it out to take it on. But I don't think they're necessarily slugging it out to take it on. My guess is rather than take it on, those contenders will have to learn to live with it. Because my friends, I think it's quite clear that coax isn't going anywhere soon. And possibly with that in mind, I could, if you all agree, perhaps we've learned a little something here. Uh, I may make the suggestion, therefore, now we all love coax. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I'll now hand you back to Deb, the moderator, and uh, we'll see where we go from here. Thank you.
you done. That was great. Thank you, Arthur. And I must say that picture of Oliver Heaviside is somewhat intimidating. I, I don't know if I would want to meet him in a dark alley with those wild eyes. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a couple of quick questions from our audience. Um, the first question I have is, um, we always recommend RG6. So what happens if the facility has existing RG59? Okay, that's a good question, Deb. And I know that RG59 historically in the States has been more of a standard cable. Um, the answer to that question is we can use RG59 with care. Uh, remember back a few slides back we talked about skin effect. RG59 will be more likely to experience skin effect more likely to let go of those high frequencies. But uh, all is not lost. We can, we can understand and control that, and it's very easy to test. If on the network we are installing or inheriting as RG59, we can simply fit a ZV modulator at the head end, launch at a known signal strength, launch at a very high frequency channel, top of the UHF band 800 plus megahertz and will measure the signal strength of that signal at points on the network. We'll plot it against the cable manufacturer's chart of expected loss at that frequency and we can see easily then whether or not we are experiencing any skin effects. Generally speaking, we won't be. If we are, all is not lost we can use specific amplifiers with slope gain, pre-emphasized gain, to give us more gain at the top end. And we can use slope correction to set right the imbalance. So we're not losing the high frequencies so much as we are going to suppress the energy in the low frequencies, and we're going to allow it all through. So can we use RG59 as a suitable cable? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. And um, along those same lines, where does RG11 fit into this equation? Okay, RG11 fits in very well to this equation because we would choose to use it for any larger diameter cable where we have long trunk lines uh, running long distances, maybe um, distances between buildings, maybe gaps between large areas in the building. So yes, RG11 is a good cable to use in those trunk situations. It's lower loss and it will benefit us. Ultimately, we will need fewer amplifiers. Great. All right, I have a question from Alan who would like to know if um, a one gigabit internet and TV will run over RG6. Yes, yes, I see no reason why not. Um, we have to be sure. Do you remember on the on the chart from earlier when we when we looked at the DOCSIS bands at the bottom of the frequency range? That's where the cable TV boys are putting their their uh, their internet um, their internet signals uh, and the DOCSIS signals. Uh, and there's no reason why we can't have multiple gigabit bandwidths in those low frequencies up. They need to avoid the areas where we are assigning our own TV channels, but they very happily live together on the same cables, and they are subject to the same rules of loss and uh, loss and gain as our signals because they've been modulated into carriers to travel on our coax. I have to make that point especially. Yes, DOCSIS modulates the, uh, uh, the, the internet signals. Thank you. Uh, Jim would like to know why F connectors versus using B and C or some other type. Okay, yeah. Um, F connectors tend to be more robust. Uh, I, I should say B and C connectors are excellent. Very often used in test equipment in our industry and in the coax industry. RF. So um, B and C connectors are excellent. F connectors tend to be more robust. They tend to be simpler. If you, if you look at the F connector, it almost isn't the connector at all because it's allowing the inner core direct access to the socket. 
without any pin or stinger or interconnect. And of course, the shield, the shield in the body of the connector, is little more than a continuation of the screen. So they're, they're very robust, they're very simple, their matching is excellent. And of course, we have to remember that when we're installing these connectors is in some pretty unfriendly uh, environments. And we need to know that it's a good one-shot connector, simple and easy. So um, BNC is very good. F connectors probably develop to be better under the use condition. Thank you. And then uh, kind of a follow-up to that, when you are putting an F connector on an RG6 cable, does it make a difference how long the center conductor comes out of the connector? Okay. In keeping with normal practices for F connection and making F connectors, the center core should come out of the connector by say two, three millimeters, maybe four millimeters maximum. It should always be proud of the connector. That's helpful. Great, thank you. Well, that's all the questions I see coming from our audience right now. Um, just a reminder that we are doing an encore presentation tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock Eastern time. That's one o'clock Pacific time. Um, so if you would like to uh, invite your colleagues to attend, you found it helpful and interesting and informative, um, send them to zv.com. There's a link there where they can register. Um, we will send you the presentation uh, in an email after the webinar. And um, you can view the archive recording on zv.com as well. So with that, if there are no other questions, thank you, Arthur, for, uh, for that presentation. We really appreciate it. And thank you, all of you, for attending today. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedules for this. Have a good afternoon.